Uh, it's a real uh, special privilege for me uh, to introduce our first speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Sunshine is a product of the City of Denver and of the University of Colorado, where he earned his BA and MD, uh, after which he spent a year in Baltimore as an intern. Uh, and unlike uh, many of the people we'll be hearing from today, he was not at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, but uh, after that year, he then spent two years uh, in the Navy and was assigned a tour of duty in Taiwan, uh, which has generated an unending uh, stream of wonderful stories uh, that still echo across the decades. In 1959, he came to Stanford, uh, where he has been for essentially uh, the entirety of the last 60 years, with the exception of a brief hiatus uh, when he uh, went south to spend uh, a short period of time in uh, Children's Hospital in L.A. And uh, we were uh, delighted when we were able to get Phil uh, back here home, uh, where uh, he's been our uh, mentor and spiritual guide uh, for uh, most of the last 60 years. Phil has uh, not only made many independent contributions of his own, but has been uh, a wonderful mentor to many young people and many no longer so young people, and I count myself very privileged to be among that group. Uh, Phil has also uh, shown a, a great aptitude for recruiting people from other disciplines uh, who may not have been interested in problems of the neonate uh, to get interested in looking at things that were going on with the babies. And uh, David described the collaboration that uh, Phil facilitated between uh, uh, radiologists and uh, pathologists around the uh, recognition of BPD as a new uh, condition uh, as an example of that, but there are many, many more. Uh, so Phil's contributions are not only direct uh, but indirect. Uh, having been here uh, really seeing uh, neonatology uh, from its birth uh, through its development uh, over these past decades, Phil's in a unique position to give us a perspective on the uh, 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 where we've come from uh, and how the discipline has evolved over that period of time. So it's my pleasure to introduce at this time Dr. Phil Sunshine. Please help me welcome him. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, and uh, thank you, Dr. Cornfield. You've given half of my talk. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can do this correctly. I have nothing to disclose, unfortunately. <laughs> a little bit of the history, as you all are aware, the disease, hilum memory disease, was first described by Dr. Hochheim uh, in premature infants. And for a long period of time, uh, uh, newborns really had very little uh, benefit of any form of therapy that had been provided for them other than comfort care. Uh, in the 20s to the 40s, uh, after a paper was published pointing out that uh, at least in infants and diabetic mothers who died with uh, hyalomembrane disease, there was a lot of amniotic debris in their respiratory tract. So one of the ways of trying to prevent this was uh, immediately after delivery, uh, following a cesarean section, uh, the pediatrician was there to perform gastric lavage. It didn't really change the course of the illness, but it was very renewed for the doctors who were providing that care. And that was about the only thing that uh, really was uh, uh, accomplished. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, various treatments were used to treat RDS. Dr. Ilpo was one of the first, back in 1935, started to use intragastric oxygen, which didn't seem to have much benefit. There was the Biloxum positive pressure unit uh, that uh, kept the baby warm, but really didn't improve outcome. There were also various other treatments, including putting a, a sternal hook and connecting it to the top of the incubator so that the baby would have greater expansion of the respiratory tree. Uh, all that did was uh, uh, cause the baby to have some sternal bleeding and uh, didn't seem to improve the outcome. Uh, Bill Silverman probably did uh, one of the best forms of therapy, and that was to put a roll of blankets under the baby's shoulder uh, to increase the respiratory area or to increase the lung. Uh, wasn't a carefully controlled study that he's famous for, 
And again, uh, that may have had a minimal effect, but not very much. He then did a very carefully controlled study of increasing the mist in the incubator, hoping that would improve outcome. And again, that failed. Uh, because hyaline membranes were found, it was felt one of the best ways to get rid of it was to use uh, fibrinolytic therapy, plasminogen, and the like. Uh, and that was in, fa uh, in vogue for several years without any benefit. And then Bob Usher published his studies. Bob was uh, going through a divorce at that time. He was spending a lot of time in the nursery watching babies, and he noticed uh, that the babies, as they were approaching death, their potassiums went very high. So he started infusing IV glucose and sodium bicarbonate, and this became known as the Usher technique. And I'm sure he improved outcome in some babies because of uh, he almost special the care of those infants in, uh, in the nursery. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it uh, didn't really alter the outcome of many babies. Then there were other forms of therapy. Uh, one of the first was by Dr. Stowens, who was a pathologist, and he recommended the use of Epsom salt cinema. He noticed that these babies, when they died, their lungs looked like liver, they were full of fluid, or he thought they were full of fluid, so he felt if he could get rid of it by using Epsom salt cinema, you could improve outcome. Uh, he reported uh, 28 babies uh, to a scientific group none of which he really took care of. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of infants were subjected to Epsom salt cinema, and all it did was remove excessive amounts of meconium if it were present, but it didn't alter the outcome. Because uh, little girls did better than little boys, as far as uh, hyaline membrane disease was concerned. Uh, little boys were given estrogens to see if that could improve outcome. And again, that didn't seem to work. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about the pulmonary vasodilators, acetylcholine and tilazoline. Uh, acetylcholine was uh, first used, uh, and uh, I'll come to this again. A uh, group from uh, Case Western Reserve and UCSF uh, went to Singapore. Uh, Marshall Klaus had uh, somebody design a uh, aerosolized dipalmotilesithin to use on babies to see if that would improve outcome. It really didn't work, and John Clements uh, came to the group and felt that one of the things that was happening with these babies was poor pulmonary perfusion, and if they could provide a drug that would open up the pulmonary vasculature, uh, perhaps they would have a better outcome, and they started to use acetylcholine. And behold, this uh, really was beneficial in some of the babies. And uh, they came back and wrote a paper about uh, hypoperfusion in respiratory distress syndrome. Ernie Cotton was part of this group. He and Bill would take care of the babies during a period of time. Bud Sweet and Marshall would take care of them at uh, the other times. And interestingly, after uh, Ernie came back to the University of Colorado, he published uh, almost a letter to the editor of uh, five babies that he had cared for that he had given uh, tilazoline, priscoline, and noticed the uh, benefit uh, by using that particular agent. Uh, I think he was influenced because at the University of Colorado at that time was a classmate of mine by the name of Robert Grover working with uh, Gil Blount, and they had shown that uh, use of tilazoline in infants and children who had pulmonary hypertension uh, would benefit from this treatment, even though it was only uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes on a temporary basis, but it had a potent effect in uh, lessening the increased pulmonary pressure. Uh, Boyd Getzman, uh, working here, uh, working with the people at Davis and at Stanford, recommended that we use uh, tilazoline in patients who had increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Initially, it was used for babies who had meconium aspiration or PPHN with seemingly good results. We then started to use it also in babies who had uh, respiratory distress syndrome with varying degrees of uh, benefit. Uh, it turns out that over a period of time, uh, with acetylcholine, these babies developed tachyphylaxis. With tilazoline, there were a lot of uh, 
unwarranted or unwanted complications. So over a period of time, we stopped using uh, both of these drugs uh, because we felt it wasn't very beneficial. Interestingly, Robert Bartlett, who was at uh, UCI, uh, started to work on what appeared to be an artificial placenta. He was trying to work out something like a heart lung machine for babies with hilar membrane disease. And uh, over a period of time, recognizing that these small babies had so many complications, especially with bleeding, that his technique could be used in bigger babies. And in 1976, he reported his first uh, good outcome in baby uh, with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension, and I think baby had meconium aspiration. And then in a short period of time, he moved to Michigan, where after several years, the use of ECMO uh, blossomed. It wasn't really effective in uh, be treated with babies with, uh, with hilar membrane disease or respiratory distress syndrome, but it certainly changed the way we manage babies who had respiratory failure due to other problems. Uh, going back, uh, one of the first uh, group to use a synthetic uh, dipomotolecithin uh, was a group from Canada, Dr. Robillard and Allery and their group. And uh, it was interesting, they had 11 babies, and uh, eight of these babies survived. Uh, and some of them, or four of them, that were less than uh, 1,500 grams. In fact, one baby was 680 grams but they felt that it really didn't improve pulmonary outcome, and they abandoned its use. I never could find another paper by Dr. Robillard, but Dr. Allery went on to become a world's authority in the various toxins that affect the respiratory tree. And uh, then the second major use, major uh, uh, presentation was by the UCSF Case Western Reserve Group, as I mentioned before, that used dipomotolecithin as an aerosolized spray, essentially with no benefit found. Uh, this is one of my heroes, uh, Dr. Ian Donald, who uh, was one of the first to use uh, assisted ventilation in the care of preterm babies who had respiratory failure. Uh, during a period of about six or seven years, he ventilated initially with a negative pressure ventilator, then with a positive pressure ventilator, 150 infants with 51 of these babies surviving. He's a very interesting man. He was born in Scotland, family of physicians, grandfather, father. Uh, he's a graduate of St. Thomas uh, Hospital Medical School, took his residency in obstetrics, and was, uh, in, uh, uh, be, was drafted into the RAF, where he served for four years from 42 to 46. He uh, was learned a lot about radar, and uh, this had a great influence on him uh, throughout his life. And uh, I'll come to that in a little bit. But while he was uh, at St. Thomas, he got the idea that maybe something could be done to help these tiny babies uh, who went into respiratory failure and died. So initially, he developed a uh, negative pressure ventilator that had some benefit. And then he developed a, uh, a patient cycle positive pressure unit, initially using a face mask, and then later on uh, uh, using an endotracheal tube to ventilate these kids. He called it augmented ventilation because what he wanted to do was the baby would initiate breathing. And then the, uh, with the uh, technique that he developed, the a uh, ventilator would turn on and give the baby augmented breathing. And uh, as I said, they had pretty good results for babies who were critically ill and uh, went on to uh, yeah, about a, th a third of the babies uh, would survive. Interestingly, he worked with a radiologist by the name of Steiner where they developed a portable uh, x-ray unit and they could take films and follow the course of the baby's uh, illness. Uh, t during the first uh, week or so of life. Before that, of course, they only had post-mortem findings, but uh, with the use of this uh, cathode and with the uh, way that they uh, uh, had a portable incubator, they were able to uh, really follow the uh, course of infants uh, with this disease. 
uh, he left uh, Hammersmith and took a job as a chief of, P of uh, OB at Glasgow. And here, uh, because of his interest in radar, is one of the pioneers in developing ultrasound in use of uh, uh, pregnant women. As you can see, there are several pictures here uh, using uh, this technique. As you can see, it's quite large in uh, evaluating the growth and development of the fetus uh, by ultrasound. Uh, he was a Regis professor. Unfortunately, uh, he was never knighted. He probably should have been. He, here's a picture of him showing a queen mother around his unit, meeting with Pope John Paul. He retired in 1976, and he died in 87. But he was really one of the people who had a profound influence on the use of assisted ventilation <clears throat> in the newborn. In the 60s and 80s, was the people started to use uh, supportive ventilation, the negative pressure ventilation uh, was probably the Moynihan or the Air Shields. Millie Stallman was a pioneer, as was uh, uh, Roberta Ballard and uh, Willard Blankenship. Blankenship had been a fellow with Millie, and they had pretty good outcome, especially if the baby weighed over 1,500 grams. Positive pressure ventilation was introduced about the same time, and you can see the individuals who were involved in improving the outcome. Uh, the Smythe uh, was a, a real pioneer as well, and he developed, uh, or he cared for a lot of babies with neonatal tetanus, and was able to show that if you sedated these babies, you could ventilate them for periods of days to weeks, and many of them would recover. Uh, we became involved in our first baby put on a ventilator was in 1962. Uh, Dr. Thomas Daly uh, McSweeney were the people involved. Uh, the major uh, change in the way we ventilated babies was instituted by the group at UCSF. Uh, doctors Gregory, uh, Kitterman, Vibbs, Tooley, and uh, Hamilton, who was the chairman of the Department of Anesthesia. And by use of uh, using uh, CPAP and PEEP really changed the way that we care for babies on a ventilator. And every unit that's been built since that time has incorporated this. And I think this has, was one of the major discoveries that have improved the outcome of babies with respiratory failure. And soon thereafter, uh, working with Forrest Bird, uh, Bob DeLimas, and uh, Kirby uh, developed the Bird Baby Bird Ventilator that would be able to provide necessary pressure, provide an inspiratory time, uh, and positive pressure, and uh, whatever oxygen levels that you could would use. You have to realize that when we first started ventilating babies, there was no Veriflow. So you had the choice of either 100% oxygen, 40%, or room air. So you couldn't dial down the oxygen concentration. You would jump from one to the other. As the baby got better, you go to 40%, and then down to uh, room air in a very short period of time if the baby was going to survive. Uh, Bill Bennett's uh, brought in a new form of therapy uh, in babies with respiratory failure. Initially, this was used primarily in babies who had pulmonary hypertension or who had meconium aspiration or neonatal sepsis. Uh, but he encouraged us to use it in babies who had uh, respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, I think uh, out of the first number of babies that uh, uh, Bill used it on was, uh, uh, see, there were 11 babies in their first report that had uh, respiratory distress syndrome. And interesting, nine of the babies survived. Uh, there had been two reports previously, uh, one by Dr. Apple, one by Dr. Beverly, where they had used nitroprusside. They said it was in the infants of, who had high memory disease, but one of the babies was a baby that was 38 weeks gestation and weighed almost three and a half kilos. So I think he probably had something else rather than respiratory distress syndrome. But we used this for a period of time with very good results and minimal complications. But right after this was uh, published, then surfactant uh, suddenly became available, 
and uh, was being used. Uh, also, uh, we start using different kind of ventilators, uh, high frequency, and the first to uh, develop a uh, high frequency ventilator was uh, John Emerson, uh, who was a wonderful uh, gentleman who uh, first used it in 55. He got a patent in 59. He called it the airway vibrator. Uh, Dr. Luckenheimer used it in laboratory animals. And then in 83, Forrest Bird developed what eventually turned out to be the uh, bronchiton, bronchotron, a uh, little picture of the, some of the more recent uh, uses or the, what it looks like uh, at the present time. But these were the people who really pioneered the use of uh, high-frequency ventilation. First major study, a multiple center study, was carried out or published in 89 by the Hi-Fi Study Group. And unfortunately, uh, they used a machine that was uh, uh, made in Japan. A lot of the investigators had not had experience with it. Uh, the data showed that there was no essential benefit uh, using high-frequency ventilation compared to the use of conventional ventilation. Subsequent studies with the high-frequency oscillating ventilation showed that there was a marked improvement, and now almost all centers have this uh, device uh, to use. The study using the jet ventilation, which our own Ron Cohn was very much involved, did show that there was a benefit and that the incidence of uh, uh, chronic lung disease was less and the survival rate was better than with the use of conventional ventilation. And uh, unfortunately, some of the initial investigators had to be dropped because they weren't using this machine correctly and the number of babies that they ventilated ended up having an increased incidence of central nervous system hemorrhage. So I don't know if anybody's using the JET anymore, but it was a remarkable instrument when it was being used in this study. Uh, <clears throat> just want to uh, point out some of the early uses of surfactant. Einhorn uh, and Horning used it uh, in 1972. And Fujiwara, who was a fellow, postdoctoral fellow, working in Forrest Adams Lab in UCLA, uh, developed a uh, dipomatolecithin and phosphatidylglycerol, mixing it with minced beef lung protein, and in 1980, published a paper showing the marked benefit of using this uh, surfactant in the treatment of babies with respiratory distress syndrome. He also noticed as the babies got better, uh, the ductus started to play a prominent role uh, in the uh, course of the infant's uh, disease. Uh, Lou Gluck and his group in the early 80s, 86, uh, were using uh, human surfactant, where they had uh, uh, gotten some amniotic fluid from uh, normal deliveries and then uh, were able to make a human surfactant that use, was used. And then in the 1990s, uh, John Clements and the group at UCSF working with Burroughs Welcome uh, developed Exosurf. Uh, this was dipomatol phosphatidyl phosphatidylcholine that was stabilized with hexadecanol and taloxapol and was very, very beneficial in the treatment of babies with uh, respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, it was so uh, it was so effective that the FDA approved it uh, in August of 1990. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, Abbott Laboratories was trying to develop uh, the surfactant that had been developed by uh, Dr. Fujiwara, and uh, they <clears throat> were held up a year because the FDA was concerned that using beef lung uh, would uh, contain prions and possibly lead to mad cow disease. So it was held up for a year, and they found animals where there had been no mad cow disease. And a year later, then uh, Cervanta was approved. I just want to finish up on the use of uh, prenatal steroids that uh, uh, 
<clears throat> David mentioned, uh, Mont Liggins, who was a perinatologist uh, in Auckland, uh, was able to show that by giving the fetal lamb uh, corticotropin, uh, he could induce labor. And interestingly enough, uh, these uh, laboratory animals or these sheep lambs would come out uh, with uh, regular respiration because the studies had shown that if you delivered the lambs prematurely by C-section, they developed a uh, disease similar to hymomembrane disease. And uh, so he wanted to see if you could give them the steroids, have them deliver vaginally, if they would have the same disease. And lo and behold, many of these animals came out breathing and sustained a po uh, ventilation for a period of time. Delimos, working with uh, Mary Ellen Avery, confirmed these studies. And then, as David pointed out, Howie and Liggins published their paper in 1972, uh, where they demonstrated that mothers who were given large doses of uh, beta-methasone uh, versus those that were given cortisone acetate, which did not cross the placenta, the babies who were delivered of these mothers, especially if they were uh, be able to receive at least two doses of the drug 24 hours apart would have came out and had a much lower incidence of uh, respiratory distress syndrome and uh, also had uh, in improved survival and less intracranial hemorrhage. The amazing thing was this was published in 72. This was not widely accepted by the obstetrical uh, members of our profession and uh, only a few centers throughout the country or throughout the world were actually using prenatal steroids. And uh, Mount Liggins pointed out that if you could delay labor by initially using alcohol, the Fuchs method, or sulbutamol later on, that the babies who could go get two doses would really have a marked improvement. Finally, in 1994, which is 22 years later, there was an NIH consensus statement on the, uh, pointing out the use of uh, antenatal steroids as being very positive in decreasing the incidence and severity of RDS and IBH. And now, of course, it's become the way that we manage uh, these infants. But that was a 20-year hiatus. And although many centers throughout the country would use the prenatal steroids, it wasn't universally adopted. So the history of this disease really is uh, sort of fascinating from probably the 1960s to the 2000s when where any of these studies were carried out. And the death rate from RDS plummeted and the outcome of the babies who survived has improved markedly. I just want to thank the following people for their help and help in giving me information and providing the slides, especially Dr. Ronald J. Wong, who put together this beautiful slide presentation. Thank you very much. Since I can't hear you, can answer the questions. Do you want to take questions, David, or should we? We've got a few moments. Anybody have questions or comments from the, the field? When Kennedy was, um, sorry, when Kennedy went to see his baby um, and um, it, in Boston, um, he was asking his doctors if he really, his baby would be intelligent enough <laughs> to go to school and to go to Harvard and all this. And the doctors turned around and said to him, Mr. President, we are trying to save your baby's life. Uh, he's dying. <laughs> so 
even a very intelligent person as a parent may not understand all this. So making decisions about deciding your genes of your baby may not be different than anyone else who doesn't even have a <laughs> education. So I just wanted to say that, especially now that we are thinking treating diseases genetically. <laughs> Thank you. I think what you said was very important. The, uh, they were worried about uh, too much oxygen, and they were worried about if the baby would end up being blind. And they were sort of measuring how much oxygen should the baby be receiving. Uh, and as you point out, they told them they were trying to save the baby's life. Well, that's, uh, that was an important part of that discussion with the uh, Kennedys. Dr. Fisher? Why are you asking me a question now? <laughs> Dr. Sunshine, um, one of the things you mentioned, I think it's really uh, worrisome, is that it, it took 20 years to get widespread impl uh, implementation of surfactant. How do we avoid that error in the future with effective therapies? I'm sorry, yes, steroids, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I don't know, do you? No. Do you, what, what's your answer? <laughs> I, QI, but I, yeah. I mean, I think that it's just very concerning that you'd have such an effective therapy with tons of information about effectiveness, and yet it's uh, ignored for nearly 20 years. Well, I hope this won't happen with new, new things, you know, but... Doctors don't like to jump in right away with some new findings, but I think in that case, I thought 20 years was too darn long. Yeah. Dr. Bland has a question. He's going to embarrass me, asking me how many of our babies got uh, Epsom salt enemas. Uh, <laughs> everyone should know that uh, you were a major player in that uh, Thomas uh, paper and in subsequent papers and that you had an amazing survival rate among babies that you put on the ventilator, uh, I believe, during the uh, late 50s, early 60s, in that time period when really other people weren't doing it, maybe Paul Swire in Toronto. But uh, the results from this center were, were really remarkable at the time, and uh, uh, you uh, certainly have a right to... Uh, uh, to tout those results. Uh, they were really great. So you played an important part in all that. Well, thank you, Dick. Well, when we first started ventilating babies, uh, we stayed at the bedside because uh, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And so we, uh, we didn't trust the nurses, and we managed the babies. The house staff were sort of left out. First of all, they didn't want to stay up all night, and secondly, uh, they do less than we did about managing the babies. When we thought we were getting very good at it, we started to let the house staff manage the infants, and our survival rate fell. So uh, it's sort of like uh, if you ask the people at the University of Colorado how come they have such great outcomes, they'll say, well, we have John Kinsella in our nursery, and he's there to make sure that the babies have a very good outcome. So that's what happens when you first start using these machines. <laughs>